So uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, the first invite speaker uh, of this morning, uh, Professor George Karnadakis. Uh, Professor George Karnadakis received his PhD in uh, 1987 from MIT, and uh, then he joined Princeton University as an assistant professor uh, in me mechanical and aerospace engineering. Uh, he then joined the Division of Applied Mathematics um, at Brown University as an associate professor in 1994, and uh, currently he holds a chair professorship of Applied Mathematics at Brown University. Um, Professor Karnadakis is a, a world-leading expert in high-dimensional uh, stochastic modeling, including pioneering work on general polynomial chaos for uncertain quantification, as well as multi-scale simulations of physical and biological systems. Among many awards, he received uh, the Ralph uh, E. Clayman uh, Prize in 2015. Today, he will tell us about physics-informed neural networks. So Professor, uh, Karnadakis, could you unmute yourself and share your screen? And the uh, stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Bindong. I, um, today we have a, um, a presentation by myself first, and then the second half I will cover algorithms and applications for uh, physics informed neural networks. And then my collaborator, uh, Dr. Shin, will, I will introduce him and he will talk about the theory. So, PINs um, uh, is a uh, a new emerging method, uh, very impactful at this point. Uh, some people uh, are adopting it and the industry is, uh, is adopting it uh, to replace even um, powerful codes uh, like finite element codes that have been around for a long time. And I want to explain to you why. Uh, of course, there are lots of methods in, in, in solving PDEs, uh, but uh, when, when we design um, PINs uh, four or five years ago, what we had in mind is a scenario where I depicted here in, uh, on the first slide, where uh, we're thinking of solving problems which are not well posed, where some physics is available, some physics is known, and some data is known, but we never know all the physics, so we can never capture all the physics because of the requirements uh, in resolution and, and scales, like in turbulence, for example. But then some data are available. Now, the data that's available is not exactly where we want them. They're not where the boundary conditions are. They're not, they're somewhere scattered in the domain. They could be in a small island inside the domain, could be scattered points and so on. So this seamless integration of data and physics encoded and all integrated by neural networks is what is uh, PINs is all about. Uh, so this physics informed learning, we started uh, more than four or five years ago, as I said, and we now have a, um, a center uh, uh, supported by the Department of, uh, of uh, Energy is one of the um, three mathematical centers, big mathematical centers. I'm the director of it. And the focus is on using physics-informed learning machines for multi-scale uh, multi and multi-physics problems. It's a collaboratory that involves the national labs, uh, MIT, Brown, um, Stanford, and, and Santa Barbara. So this, you can go on for, for more applications. Uh, what I want to explain here is, is, as I said, the algorithm, what, the, what exactly is a pin? And there are various versions of pins, uh, some applications to, to see why the industry is so much interested, why students like it a lot, and so on. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then we'll give you the theory, because we have now the first theory of convergence generalization uh, that, that puts this uh, approach, this simple approach, into solid uh, um, uh, and rigorous uh, 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 foundation. So um, a pin, if you, if you see my background, is basically, that's, that's what a pin is. Uh, if, uh, here, I, I'll use my, my, my cursor to show you oh, the standard neural network on the left. So imagine you have data at uh, space X and time T, and I have some labeled data U. If I have a lot of data, of course, I can uh, find U, just a functional approximation. Uh, a function approximation. However, I, I pretend I don't have data because in science we never have data. And if we have data, the data will be noisy. And again, what I will demonstrate here, that PINs is not to replace the other good methods that we have developed over, over so many years, but actually to solve problems that we cannot solve with standard methods, like ill-posed problems, inverse problems, uh, and, and do it fast. So, as I said, you have some labels, for example, boundary conditions or some other data measurements, scatter measurements, but then this U has to also satisfy some conservation law, some other law. Here, for example, I use as an example, the, uh, uh, 
nonlinear Schrodinger equation in 1D, and I take the residual of that. So uh, one, one of the um, ingredients of the pin algorithm is that we don't really have to compute these differential operators using some stencil, an Eno or a spectral element or any of our favorite methods. We actually use the same technology that is used to back propagate the Jacobian in this, um, in the standard neural network. We use uh, automatic differentiation to compute all these differential operators. And as you can see here, I have the equation parametric form lambda one, lambda two could be uh, parameters because I assume that I have some data somewhere so I can actually uh, discover also this equation through its parameterized form. So unlike a standard neural network where we have a, a, a loss function or regression will be a mean square error, for example, which um, uh, measures the misfit in data, here we also have uh, the physics. So therefore, we can look at how close to zero is the residual if we evaluate it at random points. So with this simple formula, we basically formulate any problem uh, without the tyranny of using a mesh generation in real applications and industry, people know that a lot, it will take six months to, to build an airplane, a floor around an airplane mesh. So we totally remove that. Then at the end, we have a weighted sum. Here I just show you that we simply sum the two, but, but in, in practice, you can use dynamic ways to weight data versus um, uh, physics. And in fact, you can add constraints like monotonicity constraint. Uh, positivity constraints, symmetry constraints, Galilean invariance, all this could be added to this uh, loss function. So uh, it's a very general framework. Uh, then you use off the shelf uh, solvers like Adam and, and, and LBFGS uh, to uh, finish the job. So how, how long are these codes from the practical point of view? One can start now and in about an one hour get results for this equation. For example, this is a viscous Berger equation uh, here I show the space-time domain. As you can see, X and T here on the horizontal. My stars are where I have data, but I purposefully chose not to have data everywhere. So for example, you can see around T equals 0.4, I have a huge gap. I don't have data there. Now I cannot solve that with, with my spectral L method, and I cannot solve that with, with Eno because I don't have any, any boundary conditions there. Okay, so I also show you a piece of code that solves this equation. You define the neural network, the left part of, the, of this composite network, and then you define the residual, just take in terms of flow the gradients, and that's the code. The code is so, so short that even professors can actually program pins now, and not just the students and, and the postdocs. So, so that makes it very exciting because I can program, I can go back and program my stuff. Uh, so by doing that, you can get very good solutions. You can be agnostic of the physics or what's going on. Uh, it's just, there's a lot of danger here, but actually there's a lot of uh, uh, good things about people who want to just get the solutions. That's why, as I said, industry likes it. So another, another uh, uh, issue that uh, is, uh, we introduced, another, another approach that we indirectly introduced with uh, PINs is that we actually change the learning paradigm. If you follow what I just played this movie, uh, it's a discontinuous function, has low frequency, high frequency, you see the Fourier spectrum on the right, it's a hierarchical learning. We learn from the low frequencies to the high frequencies. Although when, I have a, when we have a shock, it turns out that the neural network will attack the discontinuity then go to low frequencies, high frequencies. But overall it's a hierarchical, as you can see, it's a hierarchical uh, learning. Um, uh, we attack the shock, then with the low frequencies, high frequencies. And this is shown also here in this plot here on the left where we plot the number of iterations to converge to learning the modes, right? this is a decomposition of Fourier space. And as you can see here, I learned the low frequencies right away, but here it takes some time. So this is the hierarchy is, is depicted by these different colors uh, on the right as I increase the frequency. So, however, when I use pins to solve this Poisson equation, let's say fxx, the same solution with the right hand side, what I see that I can solve this solution, I can resolve this function, the solution, which is uh, this function now, sim similar function, but I, 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 cannot, I can tackle all these frequencies simultaneously. So the learning paradigm is, which we can totally change the learning paradigm by simply changing the weight in the loss function. Here the weight is simply the K square mode because it comes out from the derivative of FX, F, FXX. So imagine that you're looking at optics and you're in the gigahertz range 
how would you have 10, a frequency of, of 10, let's say, hertz, and have also a gigahertz, a multi-rate, multi-scale problem? By, by appropriately using weights in the loss function of pins, you can tackle this multi-rate, this multi-scale problem. So I, again, it's a, it's a very intuitive way of introducing multi-scale and multi-rate dynamics in any complex problem. And we demonst demonstrate actually that in a paper recently in Optical Express. Um, this is some of, uh, of the interest that's going on. Uh, some say, people say that physics informed neural networks is going viral. I don't actually follow all this, but I work very closely with NVIDIA because NVIDIA produced this code SIMNET, which is a free code. Uh, and it's a, parallel, it's a parallel code that does all the things that we have developed uh, with uh, pins. ANSYS, I'm working very close with ANSYS. ANSYS is the largest company, uh, software company in the world. It's a NASDAQ 100 company. It dominates uh, the field in mechanics and in finite elements uh, and so on. And they are replacing, they have a group now on working uh, on pins to replace or complement uh, a lot of their applications. Yeah, we're using, um, uh, using uh, this type of uh, methods, these pins, and there are variants. Uh, also, I work very closely with uh, Siemens, and they, they are interested in digital twins and other applications that we have here. But, so next, I will, I will show you a few applications. Uh, as I said, ill posed problems, problems that we cannot easily solve with existing methods, or we cannot solve them at all. And then I will pass my, uh, the mic to uh, my collaborator who will explain the theory behind all this and, and convergence and generalization. So imagine you're looking at non-destructive evaluation of materials. This material is not a simple material. I have a new Huygen hyperelastic material. What, what this means is that it, it deforms a lot. And I have some inclusion or I have some hole somewhere and I don't know where. Using a simple biaxial test where we have sensors only on the boundary, we can actually discover where is the defect? Is it, a, is it an inclusion or is it just a void? How many holes you have there and so on. So it's a very simple test that uh, can be done. So here's an example. We use Abacus data uh, to, to demonstrate. So we're looking where is the hole, how big is it, and so on. So here I demonstrate that if you parameterize the hole with the shape, the center of the shape, and, uh, and uh, you start with a totally wrong solution, you can actually discover all these parameters very quickly. You can see the deformation is huge. And we start with an initial condition where the hole is in totally wrong place, but we can discover it in, in very, very quickly. If you, if you try to use Abacus or Nastra, which is a state of the art in finite elements, it will take probably a few months to do this because it's an unknown topology. Okay, and I don't have enough data, but you have basically an unknown topology. So you, you have to build millions of grids to discover this, uh, the right topology that fits the data and fits also the constitutive equations of hyperelastic material. Um, this is some work that we published in February in, in uh, science. It relates to fluid mechanics. And again, we're looking at, imagine that you're looking at a hurricane and you're looking at CNN of a vortex that is formed by looking at the uh, droplets in the uh, sky and the clouds. And, and you say, how big is this vortex? Where's the low pressure and so on. So to demonstrate that, we took a von Karman flow, flew around a bluff body, and we say, what if we just know, visualize, if we visualize a part of this flow in this cutout here that I show you, is really an arbitrary flower where I have flow visualizations. I don't have boundary conditions. I don't know what the Reynolds number. I don't know anything. I just know that I have a video of this flow in this patch. Can I build a neural network like this NSF net here, Navier-Stokes flow net, where I couple the passive scalar to the underlying physics, and can I infer the velocity and the pressure? In other words, this is the ultimate ill posed problem. I don't have boundary conditions. I don't have the parameters. I, I have only this arbitrary domain. And it turns out, and you can see the details in this paper, that we can infer the velocity, we can infer the pressure within 5% accuracy. If you add noise, you can go to 10% accuracy. But you actually have to add a lot of noise to lose accuracy. Now, one of the reviewers said, if you are so good, if this is so robust method, can you actually do the real problem, which is, can you look from smoke visualizations? Can you find the forces on the body? All right, so that's, a, that's not a trivial problem to go from, from, from just visualizations, qualitative pictures, a, a, a deck of, 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 of slides, 
of, of, of our video, going to actually computing the force, like the drag force and the lift. And you can see here uh, in this uh, synthetic data that we use uh, to, to test the accuracy, again, we can compute the drag force and the lift force, very important quantities uh, in aerodynamics, within 5% accuracy, just looking at flow visualizations. So that's why people are interested in this. Here's another biomedical application we had in, in the science paper. Uh, the doctors usually, if they deal with aneurysms, these are the unwanted dilations of brain arteries. This is a real brain artery, 3D. They eject some contrast agent, like a dye. I don't know if you see the movie here on the right. And then you want to find out from there when this aneurysm will burst. It's a very important problem, right? Because then that's how you have a brain stroke. Well, the doctors have no clue. They just look at this. They don't know fluid mechanics. And they have no quantitative information. So then with the naked eye, we say, well, I will operate on your brain when this becomes this big. But this may not break. In fact, this may not burst. And there are people who go around with one or two aneurysms in their brains, and they're just fine. Uh, so, so we wanted to, to tackle this, this problem. It's an ultimate inverse problem. Again, ill pose problem. I just have dye. I don't have boundary conditions. I have the, this geometry from real data. So it turns out that you can actually infer the uh, correct pressure, the correct wall shear stress, and therefore you can use techniques from mechanics to say exactly when this aneurysm will burst. It's very important. We use synthetic data, sorry. We use synthetic data to visualize this, see how accurate we do. This is what we infer on the right. Inside, we're just looking at inside the aneurysm. We don't have to have the, whole, the entire domain that will make it prohibitively expensive. And then with CFD, we were able, standard CFD codes, we were able to, to validate this uh, particular case. Here is another example close to home, very realistic. We found this video by LaVision uh, on, the, on YouTube. And we said, can we estimate how far your droplets will go if you wear this mask and different types of mask? Just from the video, nothing else, totally ill posed problem. Uh, so I want to show you that indeed, we can infer the velocity field. We can infer the pressure. Here's a pressure puff. What you see here with the red is a pressure puff. We compute the pressure and here's the velocity field that we compute dynamic velocity field just from video, just from that one uh, to this slice. Since then, we work very closely with uh, LaVision. It's a big company on lasers. And, uh, and so, so they did this really interesting visualization. It's morning, so I'd like to offer some coffee to, to you in the West Coast. So this is the cappuccino machine, and they took the cappuccino mug, and they took a, a slitherm photography, thermal gradients about, above the um, 3D, actually, slices. So the question was, can we determine the flow field and the pressure field about the, uh, above the cappuccino? Maybe not to so much great interest to industry, but, but um, I, I drink cappuccino a lot, so I, I'm really interested in this problem. So here I can show you that uh, we were able to estimate, we, by matching the temperature field, which basically is the thermal gradients from, from the slim photography. This is just one slice, but we have it in 3D. We, we were able to visualize, uh, to, to extract the pressure field and indeed the velocity field. Uh, and we're working with them now to do Formula One applications, the real applications, but this is my favorite application. We have other examples from classical aerodynamics. I will skip that. But one thing that we realize is Standard neural networks don't work, and, and uh, we all know about uh, bad minima in uh, the gradient descent and so on. So what we introduce in our training, and I, in, I uh, highly recommend to all the people who, who use neural networks or, or, or physics informed neural networks, to use this uh, adaptive activation functions. It's a very, very simple thing. Uh, it can be used in ReLU, or it can be used in hyperbolic tangent, or, or sine, or swish, whatever your favorite activation function is you can introduce a parameter here inside. And then in this composition, you can have every neuron can have its own activation function. Not all neurons have to uh, uh, turn on and off according to one activation function. So basically, you introduce adaptivity. And in fact, it turns out by this simple, very simple trick, we have theory I'll show you, you can avoid bad minima. And also, this if, if you do layer wise, and every layer will have its own activation, adaptive activation function, it turns out that that's equivalent to a second order problem without computing the Hessian. So everybody's talking about second order problems in, in, in gradient descent, but the users don't like it. They don't like it because it's expensive. 
Here you get the second order benefit without actually having to compute. So there's a theorem by, by Kenzi Kawaguchi from uh, CISAIL from MIT shows that um, with some mild conditions that we are using an adaptive activation function and some other thing that we're doing on the slope recovery is a, is a, is a paper that just appeared in the Proceedings of Royal Society uh, this, this uh, month actually. Uh, it, and, and, and depending on the, on the learning rate, it could be constant, it could be diminishing, usually we, we, decay, we make a learning rate decay, or it could be adaptive actually. In, in, in all these cases, we can avoid bad minima. Uh, don't have time to go through the, 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 uh, the minimum, but it's very, it's very powerful. Here's an example. Let's say you're trying to resolve this function. And, and by the way, with this adaptive activation function, we beat everyone on NIST, on CIFAR, any of the benchmarks in, in terms of training. So, so we have published, not just for, for this uh, regression, but also classification. So here's an, a function we try to resolve. If you just have fixed activation function, you see that you actually don't resolve this part at all. And this is, uh, I don't know if you can see here on the spectrum, but it, it is true. And then if you use adaptive activation function, and you can see how, what happens to the loss. Uh, in, in one case with a standard activation function, you, you lock into a bad minimum, as opposed to adaptive activation function, when it takes over, you get to the real minimum. So that's really, really powerful. It's very, very simple. It's one, one line uh, code. There's some other stuff, I will skip it. I don't know if I can play this video, but it's, this is really very powerful. This is a recent uh, hackathon at DARPA. Uh, my team uh, won this because we were the only ones using activa adaptive activation functions that we were able to train a neural network to discover a surface crack on a real material, a real uh, uh, nickel material using ultrasound uh, data. So on the left, you see the real data and you can see a huge uh, refraction, diffraction of the, of the sound as it hits the crack. On the right, we're trying to follow that. And by using the physics also, by encoding the physics into the minimization, we can actually compute now the, the wave speed everywhere. And you can see right where the, the shock, the, not the shock, but the, the crack is, you can find, a, we can quantify exactly the crack. This is real data. Uh, we only use 10% of the data. Some other people, some contestants, some other teams, they said they didn't have enough data to find the crack here. We only use 10% to find not only the size of the crack, but the wave speed everywhere because we're using adaptive activation function and physics in form. I'm, I'm almost done. I want to pass the mic to, um, oops, to my uh, colleague, but there were different versions of pins. I just want to, to uh, I will skip most of it. I just want to show you this one because it's my currently favorite version of it's the, we call it generalized domain decomposition. So imagine you have a domain which looks as ugly as this. It's a non-convex domain. And basically we can use uh, domain decomposition. We can make the residuals continuous, no fluxes, unlike this continuous Galerkin or any of these other methods I worked in the past. Here, you don't need to find uh, fluxes, uh, to, know, to know fluxes. You can use these as subdomains. These are the ugliest subdomains. There's no other method in the world that can do this because you have non-convex domain, you have corners, you have, uh, you have these arbitrary domains, you don't map the domain. So in each one of the subdomains, uh, sub, sub we have a separate neural network. Uh, you can tune the neural network, you can have different adaptive activation functions, you can have different solvers, in fact, and, and of course that's ideal for um, uh, multi-scale and, uh, and, uh, and, and multi-physics problems. So, uh, you can see here the elements we use with like cookie cutters, all sorts of shapes. I will skip all this and I will go to the nice part now where uh, young uh, John, uh, who, is, who is assistant professor here at Brown, will introduce you some work I did with uh, Jerome Darbon uh, uh, here in, in, um, on the foundations of uh, physics inform neural networks. He will also, he's very good, so he will also answer all your questions. Thank you, George. I will take over the talk from here. So today I will going to talk about on the convergence and the generalization of physics informed neural network based on our recent paper. So we consider the following uh, partial differential equation of the following form here. L is a differential operator, B is a boundary operator. And our goal is to find a function that satisfies the PDE. And what is known to us are following, we have a PDE data, but not entire PDE data, F and G, but we have access to some pointwise evaluation of it. 
So here we have a residual data and the boundary data onto it. And on the top of that, we know the physical laws, which expressed as a PDE, which is the, the differential operator L and the V. So given this information, we wish to approximate the solution to this PDE. And here the physics informed neural networks comes in. It is uh, as Georgie uh, introduced before so that I can skip a little bit. So that the prototype pin loss is defined in this following manner. Here uh, for the sake of the simple notation, here we introduce this vector form. Here lambda f and the lambda b can be thought of as uh, weights in the loss function. And here vector m is representing the number of data point. Here mf is the number of data point from the residual point, and uh, mb is the number of boundary point. And with this notation, we can simply write our pin loss in the following manner. And one can also introduce some regularization terms on the top of it. So here we use the following notation, rf and rb are the regularization terms, and these lambdas are its corresponding uh, residue, uh, weights in the loss. And in this talk, we are going to focusing on this formulation and here regularization terms will be specified later from the upper bound of the expected loss of the pin. So our goal is now to uh, solve the minimization problem of this loss. And here this HM is our searching space where uh, we seek a solution to live in. Then the natural question we want to ask is for given fixed number of samples, uh, then we have a one minima, for example. Then as the number of training data grows, then we will get a sequence of the minimizers. Then we ask whether uh, the sequence converges to the solution to the PDE or not. So to analyze this, we have to look into carefully the loss decomposition of the pin. So in general, pin loss can be decomposed into three factors. One is the optimization error, generalization error, and approximation error. So here U star is the solution to the PDE and uh, HM is our minimizer. And actually HM tilde is an actual uh, thing we obtained in practice. For example, after 1 million iteration of gradient descent. And here HM hat is the best function in class. And our question is whether this minimizer will converge to the solution to the PDE. To answer this question, we have to properly find uh, 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 find the proper uh, topology to be used to well define the best approximation and the convergence. Then we're going to answer that in a moment. So to do that, we first introduce the notion of the Helder constant so that we, uh, for a function is called the Helder continuous if this is satisfied and this number is called the Helder constant. So now we've uh, introduced so called the Helder regularized empirical loss. It is nothing but we used uh, Helder constant of L of H and B of H as our regularization terms. Then by adding these two terms together on the top of the uh, prototype pin loss, and this is the Helder regularized empirical loss. The reason that we define the Helder regularized loss will be uh, shortly given. And ideally, actually, we wish to minimize the expected pin loss, which is defined in the continuous version of the norm, L2 norm and the boundary. And as a matter of fact, we've proved that this expected pin loss can be bounded by this Helder regularized empirical loss with some uh, additional terms involved. So here it's a theorem. So it says that if the training data points are IID samples from probability distributions under my condition, then with high probability, this inequality holds. And at this moment, I emphasize that we did not uh, put any optimization procedure yet. It is purely obtained from by applying probabilistic space filling argument. And with this uh, upper bound now, we are working on minimizing this Helder regularized functional, functional. And now we talk about the convergence. So in order to properly discuss the convergence of functions, we need to define some proper function classes for the minimization problems. So to this end, we define the following two assumptions. 
the first assumption is basically says that our uh, function space is powerful enough to interpolate all the training data we have. And this can be also relaxed. And the second assumption is essential for the proof. And it says uh, there exists a function in the searching space satisfying uh, the uniform bound on the Helder constant on L of U and B of U. And, and these two assumptions are both satisfied if the target the solution to the PDE already lives in our function space. And for the convenience of here, we set the, some fixed rate here. MB is the number of the residue uh, data and MB is the number of boundary data points. So by setting up this relation, we can translate, uh, we can rewrite all the notation in terms of MF only. Now we have the following theorem. So suppose the assumption one and two hold, then HMF is a minimizer of our loss first rate of MF to the minus alpha over D. And furthermore, with the probability one, we have the following convergence. And this convergence reveals the, uh, what is the right topology to be used. This is the uniform topology. However, at this moment, we cannot say the convergence of the H, the minimizers to the solution to the PDE. And to do that, we actually work on some specific class of PDE where some uh, desired property uh, hold. So to do that, we actually, uh, to guarantee the existence and the regularity and the uniqueness, we adopt the Schaubler approach for linear elliptic and the parabolic PDEs. The available information on hand to us is two information here. The L of H goes to uh, F and B of H goes to G. So in this case, we need uh, some sort of like sensitive analysis of the PDE. So what I mean by sensitive analysis is the following. So if u is a function satisfying this equation, so L of u is epsilon, B of u is epsilon, then is u necessarily small whose norm is controlled by the norm of epsilon? So this is what I mean by the sensitivity. If epsilon is exactly zero, we can conclude that u is zero, but it is not trivial uh, in, in many cases whether we can have a smooth control of the norm of u. But this argument holds for the uh, linear PDEs. So by focusing on the elliptic PDE with the Dirichlet clear boundary, we uh, actually made some assumption from the Schalder theory. And this assumption is uh, needed in order to guarantee the uniqueness and the existence of the classical solution. And in order to apply the weak maximum principle to control the boundary data, uh, this assumption is also made. Now here we have the convergence theorem for the elliptic PDE. Suppose all the assumptions I mentioned hold then HMF is a minimizer of our Pelder regularized function. Then uh, by the Schauder theory, we have a unique classical solution to the elliptic PDE. And also with probability one over IID samples, our minimizers converges to the solution to the PDE uniformly. So this reveals the, what would be the right topology to be used for the analysis. And since U is also a bounded domain, C0 convergence implies L2 as well. And I will skip the proof idea. So basically we have a, by combining linearity with maximum principle of priori bound, we have this bound. And as shown before, this uh, right hand, the right hand side goes to zero so that we can show the convergence. And furthermore, a bit surprisingly, if a minimizer satisfy, exactly satisfies the boundary condition, actually we can improve the convergence mode to H1. So in other words, Previously, without matching the boundary condition, we have C0, so that AL2, but now we have H1. So this actually theoretically shed light on the importance of learning boundary condition. And as a matter of a fact, several works already noticed empirically that learning boundary condition first is importance in the success of the training. And here are the relevant papers. And similar result hold for the parabolic PDE, but I will skip this part. And now we can talk about back to the generalization error and talk about uh, what we mean by the approximation error and its corresponding generalization error. 
Now we found the what would be the right topology to be used in this analysis, that is the uniform topology. And by combining the, all the results we derive, we can show that the generalization error by pins also converges to zero as the number of the data point grows to infinity. So here let me quickly show the, some empirical result uh, uh, to justify our findings. So here we compare the original empirical pin loss. This is the prototype pin loss. And the second one is the listed regularized empirical loss. So this is a special case of the held regularized loss whose exponent is one. And here is the 1D simple case where uh, exact solution is given by tan H and we use the ResNet. And in this case, actually, all the assumptions we made are exactly hold because the neural network can exactly represent this solution to the PDE. And here we show the prediction error with respect to the number of training data. The red plus shows the result by the lifted regularized loss function and the blue shows the original pin loss. And we see the nice convergence by the LIPR. And also we see that the original pin loss also shows the convergence, but a lot faster than uh, what it is predicted. And also here I show the uh, dash line, which shows the convergence of the MF minus one. Actually, this is the rate from the worst case, the pin convergence rate. And here's another example for the 1D Poisson equation for the different function and the similar uh, behavior is observed. And here's the 1D heat equation. We see the similar behavior. We see the nice convergence and so forth. So let me conclude. So we, we establish Okay, we establish a mathematical foundation of pins. So by using Helder regularized empirical loss, we, that is obtained from the upper bound of the expected pin loss. And by focusing on the two classes of PDE, we show that the sequence of minimizers converges to the solution to the PDE uniformly, thus L2 convergence. And furthermore, if minimizers exactly satisfy the boundary conditions, the mode of convergence can be improved to H1. And this provides the consistency of the PIN methodology. And let me stop it here. So thank you for your attention. All right. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Professor Karnadakis and Dr. Shin uh, for the wonderful talk. And we already have uh, a few questions. Uh, so I'll read from the, uh, from the very first one. How does the PIN's framework handle entropy conditions for shocks? Um, yes, yeah, that's a good question, actually. In the, in the work that we published, we haven't used that. What I, 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 didn't, I didn't cover this part, but basically what we have published so far is an inverse problem where we have some data. So in that case, if you, if you and, and we're trying, we have some data, it's like a Slidium photography. You have some data on density gradients, and then you try to infer the, uh, the rest of the quantity. So that's very different from just doing the forward problem in the standard benchmark of a LUX or, or, or sod problem. Uh, so in that case, if you do the forward problem, actually we we'll try to do that, that, that doesn't work very well and you get this um, non-uniqueness. Uh, so you have to sort of pin it down. Uh, the entropy condition could do that. And actually entropy condition could very nicely be incorporated into pins because you can have arbitrary constraints, right? The heated fluid mechanics show you that exactly that. You can have some, uh, some, some data on some quantity, that's why it's called hidden fluid mechanics, uh, while, while you're, you are um, uh, coupling it to something other primary state. So, so we haven't done it explicitly, so I cannot tell you, uh, because we're in this mostly inverse problems, but I think it can be incorporated uh, as a constraint into the loss function uh, when you solve these problems. But it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Can I, can I make a comment? Sure, go ahead. I think it's easier to handle equality constraints, but not inequality constraints. Entropy condition is an inequality constraint. You can do more positivity constraints, for example. We have done positivity constraints. And you can do it also in the variational context. I didn't talk about all this stuff. That, that you can only do by, by sort of a penalty, I assume. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is not exact. No, no, of course. But this is all penalty. If you, if you see the, the loss function, the loss function, and, and the loss function, the way we, we set it up, it's about, uh, it's, it, it is like a penalty method where the weights are dynamic, in fact. There's a recent work by my student, Paris 
credit cards that you can who, who has produced this ideal dynamic weight so the, 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 the penalty constants are changing to follow the physics or or to accelerate um, the convergence of, of the gradient descent so uh, but it is a penalty formulation you're right Uh, okay, here's another one. Uh, how's the pin loss different from the least square method? Uh, from where? From the least square. Uh, oh, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, it is, um, well, in this form that I show you, of course you can, have, we, we, it turns out that this is a very interesting question. Uh, we're working on that now, but uh, uh, you can use an MSCP, uh, in fact, it turns out that for discontinuous solutions, as you mentioned that, uh, MSC is much, much better for, uh, but, but uh, there's a huge similarity between least squares and these. Uh, of course, here we use random points and, and so on, and there's a big, big flexibility. But in fact, uh, some of the ideas of least squares, and the, uh, we were studying some of papers of, uh, of Jiang, I think, that's uh, in the book of Jiang. So there is, there's quite a bit of similarity, and we rely on on some of it. And as you know, for example, for first order problem, the least squares is much better than just Galerkin, right? But that, that, that they, which is good for second order and so on. So, uh, but, but you can change that. I, what we demonstrate here is MSC, but you don't have to have that loss. In fact, most of the times in real problems, we work with uh, hybrid losses and hybrid norms and transition from one norm to the other as on the fly. And that, that's sort of part of the, uh, uh, the artistry here in this method. But uh, yeah, it's a good, good observation, very similar. But no grids. Read my lips, no grids. Okay, um, another question is, how's the adaptive active function different from weight decay? Uh, it's quite different approach whether uh, adaptive activation function actually introduced hey, hey. Introduce uh, extra parameter to tuning the activation function, but the weight decay is the, does not introduce any extra parameter. I hope that answers the question. Um, okay, um, I think we have time for another uh, quick question. Um, uh, great work for sure. Uh, what can we say about ODEs? Um, it seems all the work done involved PDEs. Can we transfer these methods to ODEs? Oh yeah, yeah, for all these? Yeah. Yeah, this is a good question. We have a paper uh, uh, coming out in, um, in neural networks where we have a, a prove a universal theorem for symplectic networks. It was something called SIMPnet, SIMPnets. And I think you'll find that uh, quite a bit similar work, but in the context of symplectic networks. And we now have a universal theorem of approximation uh, for symplectic networks. And I think that, that uh, you, you will find that very interesting. Of course, we have done uh, quite a bit of ODEs and other people have followed uh, this work, um, but more empirically. So, you know, uh, empirically you can do whatever you like, but, but there is, the, I think that the, you, you, you would enjoy uh, SIMPnet, symplectic nets, uh, because we, we propose two neuro, neural networks, which actually beat by, by a mile, the Hamiltonian neural network proposed by Google. So SIMPnets is, uh, is I, I, I will stand behind that. Uh, the, the other work that we did, it's more empirical. I cannot really make any claims. It's a case by case. Um, okay, so now, um, well, thank you again, Professor uh, Karnadakis and Dr. Shin for the great talk.